going to be talking about communication for a couple of weeks, and it seems like as a species we were have, having trouble doing that very well, or at least in a healthy way. It feels like we're losing our ability to listen to each other, becoming impatient. Also, wanting sound bites instead of oration. So what we're doing right now, actually listening to something longer than a few moments, is uh, unusual in our world today. It's not popular. But imagine a world where we don't listen to each other. Do we have to imagine it? Maybe we're there a little bit in some ways. If social media and news are any indication, you can see long discussion threads spawned by misunderstanding where people go on and on about this because they didn't really listen or pay attention to what was being said, or what the intention of the person who was speaking. And there's a lot of mean-spiritedness behind it as well. The rules of kind communication are often not there. Like, what I'm, if what I'm saying is true, is it necessary to say it? Is it fair to say it? The Lord invites us to be slow to pass judgment and assume the best of the person who is speaking or communicating, and put a good interpretation on it if possible. As we heard in the, in the book of James, you must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. But we often see those people talking past each other. They're angry, they're defensive, and they're absolute in their opinion about what they know to be true or believe to be true. I remember a post that said, uh, when people would say, remember when political activists would say, if you're not outraged, you're not paying attention? Maybe you heard that. And today it seems like everyone is outraged and no one is paying attention. A speaker who is a communication expert, Julian Treasure, calls the seven deadly sins of speaking gossip, judging, negativity, complaining, excuses, lying, and dogmatism. His conclusion is when we do these things, any one or number of these things, we make it very hard to listen to somebody else. So putting all that aside for a moment, let's begin by touching on that simple, potent story of Mary and Martha. So Jesus is in their house, and he's teaching them. I think about that story and just think, well, what would you do? What would you do if the Lord was in your house? And there he is talking to you. It would be focused on all the, oh, that's too messy, let's run around and, and clean things up, or be stressed about that. Would you be present? Would you be looking at your phone and you know, checking Facebook and Instagram or trying to get a selfie? Maybe that's what we'd be doing. Um, streaming Netflix or cleaning the stove instead of just listening, sitting and listening. I'd like to think about that story in that way. Just what would I do? What would I do if the Lord was there? How would I react? There's so much rapid fire information coming at us these days and you can understand why Martha is distracted. Martha, Martha, you're distracted by many things, by much serving. And of course, she says to Jesus, well, don't you care that Mary has left me alone doing all this? Tell her to help me. Like, this is what we should be doing. We should be running around making sure everybody has what they need. So she sort of created this victim scenario, but no one told her to do that. No one said, hey, Martha, would you make sure everybody has everything they need? Would you make sure the house is clean? No one said that to her. He said, Martha, you are worried and troubled over many things. One thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part that won't be taken away from her. She was sitting, and she was listening. The Lord was in the house, her house. What do we do? Another potent story, the story of the sower. The sower went out to sow, and as he seed, some, as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside where the ground was packed down, the hard earth. Some fell where there were stones and not much earth, where it sprang up. But when the sun came up, it was scorched and it died. And some fell among thorns. And when the thorns rose up, they choked the growth. But some fell among good soil. And the Lord is telling us this beautiful story to ask us the question for ourselves to reflect on what do we do when the truth is spoken to us or when we encounter the truth. Are we too busy at the wayside? Is things packed down? Are we too convinced of our own ideas of what's right? Hard-headed, that we already made up our mind? Do we have a lack of care or a lack of appetite for the truth? In that case, the birds of the air, our own 
false thoughts and principles take away the truth that's sown. Where the stone, where there's a little bit of soil and lots of stone, it could be interesting to us. We, we might find the truth interesting, but as soon as we're challenged, as soon as the sun comes up, as soon as self-love rises up, something that interests us a bit more, we say, well, okay, it dies out. It doesn't really take root. Or there's no place for it to take root, really. But the ground where there is weeds, do selfish or evil behavior choke out our efforts to let the Lord's truth grow within us. But there is good ground in the story. A mind, picturing a mind that is open, picturing a mind that has been worked on, where someone has taken the time to remove the stones, tilled the soil, softened it up, watered it, and made it receptive. And when we shun evils, we do the work of self-examination, we are doing the work of preparing the soil for the Lord's truth to take root in us. So yeah, it takes work. It takes effort, it takes attention, but if we can do that, then all this, our efforts to actually have the Lord's word take root in us will happen. It will have an impact. Listen to what the writings say here. It says, but in, every, in very deed, the moment you shun evils as sins, the moment you shun evils as sins, the Lord inflows from heaven, takes away the veil, dispels the cloud, opens the spiritual mind, and so introduces you into heaven. You hear all that? <laughs> the moment you make some effort, till the soil, make some effort, the Lord flows in, opens, dispels the clouds, opens heaven, our mind is, and we're introduced into heaven. It's a beautiful teaching. So the sower story is about what attitudes or mindsets the truth is greeted by in us. So we're invited to take a look at ourselves. Well, what is my attitude? What do I bring to the Lord and his word? So we're going to be talking about communication, and one key to communication is listening. How what people say is received by us. What attitudes or mindsets their words are greeted by. So let me first ask, what does it mean to you to listen? What is it, when you hear say, hey, will you please listen to me, what does that mean to you? I think we all have different definitions of what it means to listen. And I think we all would agree, though, when someone doesn't listen to us, when we are sharing something with them, we feel unimportant. We feel brushed aside. We feel ignored. We feel disrespected. But we also tend to have different demands for different people. As a parent, usually listening means to our child, you will hear what I say and you will do it, right? You will promptly obey my instructions. That's the expectation often as a parent. You can also have that expectation in a relationship, maybe in a marriage. If I say something, I expect that you'll do what I, what I said, or you heard what I said. Or if you ask a partner for advice, we expect advice that they give. They expect the advice that's given to be followed. Like, why would you ask me for advice if you're not going to do what I said, <laughs> right? Why, why ask if you're not going to follow? Well, often between friends, we just want someone who's going to hear us this sympathetic or empathetic ear that's going to show that they understand. The word for the new church tells us that there is a living relationship, what's called a correspondence between our ears and hearing and obedience. So the ears correspond to not only hearing, but obedience to what is heard. So the people were in the Old Testament wore earrings or ornaments on their ears because they represented obedience to the Lord's word. They wore them to show, I will hear and I will obey. The writings say this, to hear as being to attend, that is to observe with attention and to hearken or obey. For the things that enter by the hearing are not only seen by the understanding, but also if they are in accord with our affection, they are obeyed. So the expectation with the Lord's word, with us as spiritual people, is to hear what the Lord says, but also to obey it. And I know we don't always get that right. Maybe we hear it, we understand it, but shifting it into obedience is a different thing altogether. But how good are we at that? Notice what we say at the end of the readings every Sunday in church. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it or do it or obey it. The same sort of thing is meant by that. Blessed are they, and that's just not something that we make up. That's a sentence of scripture that says, blessed are they who hear the word of God and obey it or keep it. For the Lord said, Whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them will be like a wise person who builds their house on the rock. 
So if we're wise, we'll hear these things, but we'll also do them. So if you want to be happy, listen to what the Lord says, but also strive to work on it. And I know it takes a lifetime often to make these things part of our lives, but the intention is to hear and obey, hear and hearken to it. So what are some reasons why we have difficulty hearing or listening? Well, sometimes we have a hard time because we're hurting. We are in pain in some way. Our lives are in a difficult situation. Exodus 6, verse 8 says, I will bring you into the land that I swore to give Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I will give it to you for possession. I am the Lord. Moses told this to the Israelites, but they would not listen to Moses because of their broken spirit and their cruel slavery. So the Lord said this to them, but it says they couldn't hear it because of their cruel slavery and their broken spirit. So sometimes we're in that situation. We're in too much pain. Our life is too difficult. We can't separate ourselves from that to hear it. You ever talk to someone about your own struggles and they're in just too much struggle and too much pain themselves to actually hear what you're saying? Or if you're really sick and someone wants to tell you all about their lives, you're like, I can't, I can't. I don't have enough strength to do it. It's kind of like being hungry. If you're hungry and someone wants to give you, have a long conversation with you, it's like, I, hold on, time out. I need some nutrition. I need to eat something before I can actually pay attention. But if you get fed, if you get well, you can change that. You don't have to become someone's therapist, but just recognizing that everyone has a story. Everyone has a history. Everyone has a past. Everyone has their own hurts. And it may be impacting their ability to listen. And we might have to listen to what's going on with them. So we have those issues. They have those issues too. Another reason why people have a hard time listening is there's no incentive. There's nothing in it for them. Like, what do I get out of this if I listen? Listen to this from Exodus 8. It says, but when Pharaoh saw that there was a respite, remember how the, all the plagues were coming upon Egypt and Pharaoh, when Pharaoh saw that there was a respite, he hardened his heart and he would not listen to them, just as the Lord had said. So if you read that story of the plagues, you think at some, you're reading them and you think, Pharaoh's got to relent now. He's got to hear, right? Because things are falling apart. And at some point, he's like, he seems like he's going to, but then the plague goes away and he's like, no, no, no. They can't go. It's the same kind of thing when we're, everything is, when things aren't going well, we're a lot more receptive, it seems, to, to changing. But when things are fine, it's like, oh, I'm fine. Just think about the story of the, the judges. If you've ever read the book of Judges, you know the children of Israel, they're in trouble a lot. They cry out to the Lord. The Lord sends them a judge, um, heals the situation or gets rid of the enemy. And then they're like, oh, we're fine. And they forget about the Lord. And then they get attacked by another enemy. And it just keeps going. Just, it's a cyclical thing that goes on in the book of Judges. Because when things are good, they don't listen. When things are bad, okay, you have my attention. Sometimes we suffer from impatience as well. We're anxious to get on to something important. So someone's talking to us. It's like, mm, I really am not interested because I really want to go watch the game. Or I've got something else I want to do. Or I want to tell you what I have to say about the subject. I don't want to listen. Another thing I want to say about listening is try to be curious about what someone is saying. You heard the statement from Walt Whitman, be curious, not judgmental. I noticed that it's hard to do. I've noticed that with my children. They come and tell me something and then like I start the judgment instead of well, tell me more about that, or why is that, why do you feel that way, rather than, that's wrong, you shouldn't have done it. <laughs> like, huh, how can I stay in a place of curiosity rather than jumping to judgment or correction? Tell me more, why? Another thing is to listen carefully. Exodus 15 says, he said, if you will listen carefully to the voice of the Lord your God, and do what is right in his sight, and give heed to his commandments, and keep all his statutes. I will not bring upon you any of the diseases that I brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Do we listen carefully? Do we listen carefully to what the Lord is saying, so that we know what the message is, and that we can actually try to obey it in some way? 
And part of that is listening for the meaning, not just the words. I know sometimes it's easy to get caught up in, well, you used the wrong words. That's not what that word means, or that's the wrong tense or something, or just get so focused on the words that are being said rather than, let me listen for what it is you're trying to convey. That is what matters. It's the spirit. The letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Another thing is listen with compassion. Try to listen with compassion. Exodus 22 says, And if your neighbor cries out to me, I will listen, for I am compassionate. There's often something behind what someone is saying. Sometimes, again, there's that hurt. What is it that they're trying to convey? Just find the hurt or the heart behind what's being said. If you ever had raised children, you know that sometimes what they tell you isn't the whole story, right? Like maybe you get a call that your child's acting out of school, and you think, well, obviously, child, you're to blame for this. You did something wrong. If we don't listen, if we don't inquire, we're not curious, we might not find out that someone was actually being cruel to them at school as well. So that caused them to react. Doesn't make it right, but at least we can get to the point of why. Or maybe someone gives you an angry response to something you ask them, but they just recently were diagnosed with cancer and you didn't know that, but they're feeling stressed out. I read this too, which is very interesting. It says the number one cause of affairs in America, the number one cause of adultery and that marriages break up is that somebody found a sympathetic ear. Most affairs do not start with sexual attraction. Most affairs start because somebody found a sympathetic ear at work that they didn't find at home. They found someone who would look at them in the eye and listen to what they had to say. It made them feel like they mattered. Another thing is listen attentively. Put away the distractions. Just look and listen and be in the moment. And if you can't listen, say, I can't listen right now. I can talk later. Again, Mary and Martha's story. She was distracted by much serving. So what do we do? If someone wants to talk to us, shut the laptop. Put away the phone. Make time to listen. And sometimes you have to do that in a busy relationship to say, hey, let's make a date night. We need to have time so that we can listen to each other and talk to each other and communicate. I love this What this woman named Kate Murphy says, you don't have to act like you're listening or paying attention if you really are. <laughs> if you actually do it, it's not a big deal. Another thing is listening with your eyes. Remember, you remember that old song, Listen With Your Eyes? From, I think it was Captain Noah when I was growing up, the rainbow song called Listen With Your Eyes. There's a lot to be learned by facial expressions, the way the person looks, the way they're holding their body and so forth. That's why it's, it's thought that the least effective way to communicate with somebody, if it's a sensitive issue, is writing an email. Because a lot of misunderstanding can occur. You don't see what's going on with them. Try to see them face to face somehow if this is something sensitive. All right, so I'm going to ask you to try something here. Um, if you could hold your hand like this for a moment, just flat out like that. Okay. And then. Place it on your chin. All right. Good job, most of you. <laughs> How many of you did this one initially? All right. So you are, you are more evolved than, than many of us. <laughs> That's good. But you can notice from that, people do that. People pay a lot of attention to what your body is doing, more so than often what your words are saying. So. Listen to their body, what they're saying. In the story of the rich young ruler, it says Jesus looked at him, talking about the rich young ruler, and loved him. If you love people, you'll look at them, you'll pay attention to them, you'll give them your undivided attention, which tells them that they are valued. You're worth listening to, and I'm going to prove it to you by looking you in the eye. So if you're still parenting small children, when was the last time we stopped, got down, and just looked at them in the eye and listened to what they had to say, right? It's so easy to just be like, yo, what's going on? Uh-huh. <laughs> All right? And how, what does that say? Just try to put it down. 
stop, look, and listen. And try to just listen. It's really hard to do that. Just listen and say thank you for sharing, rather than trying to give advice or fix it or whatever it is. We're told that we're given two ears and one mouth so that we will do twice as much listening than we are doing talking. So if you forget that, just remember how many of these you got. All right, I got two of those. Let's listen twice as often. And we need to practice it. I think it's important, especially in a time like this where we're divided politically, we need to listen, to really listen to what people are saying. Try not to be reactive and fragile and defensive and presumptive about what people are saying. Be patient, be curious, really listen to what it is and try to understand, want to understand what they're saying. Can we enter conversations hoping to have our mind changed rather than trying to change the other person's mind? My brother's a marriage and family therapist and he says, everyone's behavior, or I'll say beliefs, makes sense. So there's many people you look out and you go, I don't understand why they're acting that way. But their behavior makes sense if we know what their beliefs are or what their story is. So as a marriage and family therapist, he's trying to get to why do you behaving this way? There's a reason you're behaving this way and it makes sense why you're behaving this way. It doesn't mean you have to behave this way, but if we can figure that out, maybe we can change the behavior. So try to lean in and listen to the story. And it can be uncomfortable, especially if you don't believe what they believe. Simon Sinek says it's an, think about it as an act of listening versus the art of listening, that it's an art. It actually takes effort and attention and skill on our part. And we listen not so we can just parrot back but what someone said, but so the person feels like we understand what they're conveying. I want to share with you this quote from Julian Treasure again. He's, I love what he says. He said, when I married my wife, I promised her I would listen to her every day as if for the first time. What a lovely goal to have. I listen to you as if I'm listening to you for the first time, as someone who I'm madly in love with. And I'll end with Larry King, which seems strange to do, but here we are. Um, I like what he said. He said, I remind myself every morning, nothing I say this day will teach me anything. So if I'm going to learn, I must do it by listening. If we're talking, we're just going to hear the things we already know and believe. But if we listen to somebody else, we might learn something that we didn't know before. Amen. Bow our heads for a prayer.